Well, uh, this is a fabulous time, obviously, in astronomy. Uh, the Keck Observatory playing the, the crucial role, I think, on the planet Earth uh, to make the great discoveries in astronomy. But there's an area, uh, the search for planets around other stars, and especially uh, answering an age-old question about how unique the Earth itself is, that is being answered by the Keck Observatory. And I'd like to, to give you an overview, um, a quick overview of what the Keck Observatory is doing to answer this question uh, about how common are other Earth-like planets. Uh, and it's doing so in combination with a spaceborne telescope called Kepler. So I'll tell you about the marriage of Kepler and Keck and how together they are answering uh, this profound question. And of course, um, the obvious uh, issue that arises is that out of the 200 billion stars in the Milky Way, we wonder what fraction of those stars might harbor Earth-like planets. And we still don't know the answer, and I won't be able to provide you with a definitive answer, but I'll bring you as close to the answer as possible. The spaceborne telescope Kepler is making a big difference. Uh, from space, it measures the brightnesses of 150,000 stars, watching to see if any of them dim in a repeated periodic way. And of course, a star would dim if a planet crosses in front of it, blocking a little of the starlight, uh, dimming that star over and over and over again. And in fact, from space, you can measure the brightnesses of stars to a part in 10,000, which is exactly the ratio of the cross-sectional area of the Earth to that of a sun-sized star. So you should be able to see the dimming of stars caused by relatively tiny Earth-sized planets using this spaceborne telescope. All it does is take snapshot after snapshot of the night sky near the constellation Cygnus. We never move, we just keep trained right on this field of view, lest we miss one of those very rare transits of a planet in front of its host star. And this shows you that the field of view, it's, it's a 10 degrees by 10 degrees, an enormous field of view, much, much larger, for example, than Hubble offers. And, and there is one of the advantages of a Kepler but I want to show you some of the data from this Spaceborne Telescope, and then I'll tell you how the Keck Observatory plays the key role in confirming the planets and characterizing the planets. So this is uh, Kepler-10 is up in that little circle there. Let me show you the actual data. You're seeing the brightness of this star on the vertical axis over the course of time, about 200 days. And if you look at the scale of the vertical axis, you'll see that we've made the average brightness of the star one. And then here's 0.9995 of one. And you can see the noise up here is no more than about a part in 10,000. And if you look carefully, you can see with your own naked eye the periodic dimming of the star as a supposed planet crosses in front. So you should be able to see it yourself there's a dimming right there, and then here, and then here, and here, and here, and here, like a comb. Here's where they all are. And so you can actually immediately tell the orbital period of the planet, some 45.29 days, the interval of time between the dimmings. But moreover, this is a sun-like star, and so the amount of dimming uh, you can look with your own eye again, something like 0 0.0005 of the normal brightness. That tells you the area of the planet, pi r squared, divided by the area of the star, pi r squared for the star's radius. So immediately you have a measure of the planet's size if you know something about the star, and that's the first place where the Keck Observatory comes into play. We take spectra of these host stars and their faint 13th, 14th, 15th magnitude to learn the nature of the star and hence the size of the star and then the amount of dimming, the fractional amount of dimming tells us the size of the planet. Now there's more to data like this and let me zoom in on a little tiny green patch here, uh, a mere 10 days of brightness measurements. There's the original data, here's the zoom in 10 days 
There's one of the dimmings you saw with your own eye. But now if you look carefully, you might be able to see an additional periodic dimming in the host star. You kind of find it yourself. There's a dimming here and here and here and here and here. Something right around there if you can see the red dashed lines. So there's a second planet transiting in front of this star, but this being only 10 days of data, you can see that the orbital period of this planet is much shorter. It's about 20 hours. And moreover, it's a much smaller planet uh, because the fractional dimming is now a little more than one part in 10,000. And that means that the size of the planet is only about a hundredth that is in radius, that of the star, and that makes this roughly Earth-sized. And you can do the calculation yourself on, on the back of an envelope. Here are all the dimmings plotted on top of each other. There's the orbital period of 0.83 days. This is a very close planet, obviously, to its host star, hugging the star. Uh, and the fractional dimming, a little more than a part in 10,000, tells you the size of the planet. And it's about 40% larger than the Earth. Now this was a fantastic discovery by the Kepler telescope, um, but there's another take-home message, which is how obvious this nearly Earth-sized planet is. I mean, you can just see the dimming. There it is. It doesn't take a computer. So this just shows how powerful the Kepler telescope is, and it's operating by itself. Kepler's working great, thanks to NASA funding and a great team of scientists providing the, the Kepler data. But here's the problem. We have the size of the planet, and we have the orbital period and hence the orbital distance. And this is roughly what it would look like, all dimensions to scale, star, planet in silhouette, nearly Earth-sized, and the orbit. You can't draw the solar system, our own solar system, to scale. But here's the problem. We don't know whether this planet is rocky like Earth, or whether it's made of gases like Jupiter and Saturn and Neptune, or maybe water and gases as well as rock. So we need more information than just the size of the planet. We need the mass of the planet that will tell us the density. And that's where the Keck telescope comes in strongly. It, these stars are so faint, you need the Keck telescope, by far the best telescope in the world to do this kind of work. Frankly, the only telescope that can do a good job because you need a big telescope for these faint stars. And the idea is to watch for the wobble of the star that tells you the mass of the planet as the planet yanks gravitationally on the star. And so this old now technique of hunting for planets is being turned around backwards. We're using the technique on a planet that is almost certainly there, but to measure the mass and hence density of the planet to learn whether it's rocky with the density of a rocky planet or gaseous. So the Keck Observatory is playing the critical role in characterizing these planets. We use Keck 1, uh, as you see here, and it's marvelous uh, high-resolution spectrometer that you've already heard a fair amount about. This spectrometer is beautifully suited to measure the Doppler shifts of the starlight and hence measure the mass of the planet that's yanking on the star. We zoom in on dark spectral lines and measure tiny Doppler shifts of no more than one one thousandth of one pixel. That corresponds to about one meter per second literally human walking speed, we can tell as the spectral lines Doppler shift back and forth whether the star is walking toward us or away from us at a thousand light years away. And you can see how we do it. The amount of light in neighboring pixels varies ever so slightly, even though the spectral line moves by only a millipixel. So that's the technique. And then, of course, we have the ability to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. We have the size of the planet that comes from the Spaceborne Kepler telescope, but now with the Keck Observatory, we can measure the mass of the planet from the Doppler uh, shift of the starlight as the star wobbles. Here's the data for Kepler 10, velocity versus time. You see the velocities go up and down and up again, just in phase with, in sync with the planet that we already knew from Kepler, 
thereby verifying the existence of the planet if you had doubts, but moreover measuring the mass, and hence the density. Because, of course, it's the mass of the planet divided by the volume of the planet that tells us the density. Now, this is an interesting number, 8.8 .8 grams per cubic centimeter. You heard from Mike Brown and from Mike Muma measurements of the densities of some of the objects in the outer solar system, and you were hearing numbers like one and a half grams per cubic centimeter, maybe up to two and a half, 2.6, I think Mike uh, Brown mentioned at one point. But here is a planet with a density of 8.8 .8 grams per cubic centimeter. Well, the bulk density of our own planet Earth is 5.5 .5 grams per cubic centimeter. So this is assuredly a rocky planet with room to spare, meaning the planet itself is even denser than the Earth, perhaps because it's composed of more iron and nickel than is the Earth, or perhaps because of gravitational compression. But this is certainly a rocky planet. It was the first definitive rocky planet ever found. Uh, Kepler uh, found it, and then the Keck Observatory played that key role of verifying the planet, that it exists, and measuring its density. Uh, here's what the planet uh, is, uh, would perhaps look like as seen through the eyes of NASA animators. So put your tray table in the upright position. There's the planet, um, rocky as the Keck Observatory has verified. So close to the star that it would be blowtorched on one side, frigid, cold, dark on the other side. What the geology might be on the surface, the geomorphology, the interior geophysics, we don't know. Uh, you see these white flecks. The NASA animators put those white flecks in for reasons I have no idea. And then here's the perceived surface. Of course, we don't know whether there's plate tectonics, volcanism, other geological processes, but it's fascinating to engage the geophysicists. You see that the NASA animators watched Star Wars too many times. <laughs> but it's, it's an entirely new field of, you might say, geology. It's the study of other rocky planets. Would they have plate tectonics, volcanism, mantle convection? Would there be a liquid and solid inner core? We don't know those, uh, answer, the answer to those questions, the equation of state, the thermal history. So these planets that Kepler and Keck are discovering uh, are really opening up a whole new field of geophysics applied to other rocky planets. Now, Kepler has found a lot of these, which is great for the Keck Observatory. By Kepler finding so many, the Keck Observatory can move in and characterize them in exactly the same way. And here you see a very interesting plot, the size of the planet in Earth units, one Earth radius, four Earth radii, 10 Earth radii, and then here's the orbital period of the planet, all measured by the Kepler Spaceborne Telescope, one day, four days, 10 days, 50 days. You see lots of planets with periods of weeks and months, uh, sizes between that of Earth, four times that of Earth, which is the same as that of Neptune. And so this is an incredible, how shall I put it, treasure map of planets that the Keck Observatory now can point to to verify them and measure the masses, densities, and other properties of the planets. Now, there's one domain I want to point out that the Keck Observatory is going to play a great role in. Look here. Most of these planets being found by Kepler have sizes between that of Earth and four times that of Earth. Think about that for a moment. What is going on? What are those planets? In our own solar system, there are no planets at all between the size of the Earth and that of Neptune. There's nothing in between. Uranus and Neptune on one end, Venus and Earth at the other. The dominant planet being found by the Kepler telescope is a size domain unrepresented, not at all represented, by our own solar system. We don't know what these are made of. We don't know how they form. Uh, and they are literally mysteries as to uh, what these planets are all about, what they're telling us about planet formation. And this is where the Keck Observatory is going to come in. A key role of Keck is to measure the masses and hence densities of these critters. Are they rocky? Are they rock plus gas, rock plus water plus gas? The density will constrain what the composition and hence the formation 
of these planets might be. And of course, the Kepler telescope in space is also finding Earth-sized planets. Here are two Earth-sized planets. Here's the dimming from a planet 87% the size of the Earth. Another one 3% larger than the Earth. And so Kepler is offering the Keck Observatory the opportunity to study the properties of other Earth-sized planets. And one of the first things the Keck Observatory must do is simply take a spectrum of the host star because it's the spectrum of the host star that tells us the size of the star, which in turn tells us the size of the planet from the amount of dimming. So the Keck Observatory is playing a very key role, not just with the Doppler measurements, but just by getting good quality spectra that gives us the size of the stars. So that's important, and of course, thereby verifying the Earth-sized uh, planets shown here, the first two Earth-sized planets, Kepler 20, F and Kepler 20E relative to the Earth and Venus. Very exciting era. But there's another aspect, and that is asking the question, how common are Earth-sized planets? And you get a hint of the, um, how shall I put it, concern about this question. Look here. The, the planets that are the size of Earth, here's 1.0 Earth radii, there are some of them there, but there's a petering out right there at one Earth size. Is it true that the uh, number of Earth-sized planets and a little smaller is really uh, a dying out? Well, we need to answer this question. Uh, it's either the fault of Kepler or, in fact, the universe makes fewer Earth-sized planets. So we're studying very hard this ratio, the number of planets per star for different radii of the planets and different orbital periods. There's a, a, I could give a whole talk on what we're doing to, to answer this occurrence rate, but in brief, we take into account the tilts of the orbits. We correct for all of the planets that don't transit their host star, that are in orbit so tilted that they actually don't transit. We account for that, and we get this plot. Now, I have to tell you, this plot is not published. It's new. We just arrived at it in the last couple of weeks. So Mike Bolte is getting his camera out to take a picture of it and put it on, the, on this blog. Um, this is a precious, in my view, a precious and, and uh, unprecedented plot. It shows the fraction of stars having planets just with periods less than 50 days, i.e. inward of Mercury's orbit as a function of the size of the planet, one Earth radius, two Earth radii, four and eight. Yeah, there are very few Jupiters. Yeah, there aren't too many Neptunes, but there's more of them. But the number of planets twice the size of the Earth is quite a bit higher, as you saw from the previous plot. And interestingly, the number of planets with a size equal to that of the Earth is nearly the same as the number of planets twice the size of the Earth. There's a plateau here, assuredly, we've corrected, as you see in the red, for planets that we've missed. And in brief, we inject into the brightness measurements of Kepler mock planets, fake planets. And then we run it through the pipeline and ask how many of the mock planets in the data did we actually find. And the red accounts for the ones we missed. And in that way, we've actually verified this plateau, well, we discovered the plateau and we're sure that it's right. It really can't be off. So this is an amazing result. Moreover, the absolute numbers are to be trusted. That is to say 7.9%, 7.4%, 7.7%. If you add them up between one Earth radius and 2.8 Earth radii, 23% of sun-like stars have a planet in that size range, one to three Earths, just within Mercury's orbit. I'll say that again because this number really surprised me. 23% of Sun-like stars have a nearly Earth-sized planet orbiting in tight orbits um, within 0.25 AUs of the host stars. And of course it begs the question, well what about farther out? Out to a half an AU, out to an Earth-Sun distance of one AU. And so you get the feeling that most stars have an Earth-sized planet around it, at least out to an Earth-Sun distance of 1 AU. It's a remarkable reality. 
And in fact, of course, one of the questions we now need to answer is, well, how common are these Earths out here in the green rectangle that would have a period of roughly 365 days and a size roughly that of the Earth? And of course, as Kepler takes more and more data, Kepler will uh, reveal to us planets in longer and longer orbits. We're also building up signal-to-noise ratio, enabling the detection of these Earth-sized planets out at Earth-like orbital distances. So this is a ex very exciting time, and the Keck Observatory being the best, best observatory, the largest aperture with a great spectrometer, offers the, the most clear opportunity to characterize these planets. Uh, other people have looked at the smallest stars, even, the M dwarfs, and they too have abundant uh, Earth-sized planets. You might ask, how far away is the closest Earth-like planet? And Courtney Dressing, a, a wonderful graduate student at Harvard, has done this analysis. Uh, she's, she points out, after doing the analysis, that if our Milky Way galaxy were shrunk to the size of the United States, then the nearest star that has an Earth-like planet would be across the Golden Gate Bridge. That is to say, a few light years, she estimates 10 to 20 or 30 light years away, is the nearest Earth-like. By Earth-like, I mean Earth-sized and lukewarm, so water, if any, would be in liquid form. This offers an amazing opportunity for the Keck Observatory we should be surveying the very nearest stars. Many of them are quite faint because they are the small M dwarfs, red dwarfs. And the Keck Observatory should be surveying the nearest 50 or 100 stars with Doppler measurements to try to find those Earth-like planets. What we'd like to do is build an even more precise spectrometer for this purpose. Uh, we call it the stable high resolution a shell for Keck. Uh, Rebecca Bernstein came up with this name. And the idea is to feed it with a fiber, temperature stabilize it, mechanically stabilize it, and allow us to get down to even better Doppler precision than we can with high res specifically to hunt for Earth-like planets around the nearest stars. It's an exciting opportunity. And I'll just uh, say to finish that, um, and this is sort of a personal comment, um, some of you know that funding the Keck Observatory is not easy. Uh, we have an operating budget. It's lean and mean. We have outstanding technical staff at the Keck Observatory, outstanding scientists. But frankly, uh, the, the amount of funds we have to operate this observatory, in my opinion, is an embarrassingly small amount. For the best observatory in the world, why are we struggling? to get the extra two, three, four million dollars a year we need to run this observatory. It, it is, uh, I think, an embarrassment, uh, and it's even more worrisome that the sequester has squeezed NSF's budget and NASA's budget to the point where we're now even more worried. Frankly, the NSF made a major contribution in the past, and the NSF is unlikely to be able to help us as much, if at all, in the future. So we really have a challenge keeping this observatory uh, healthy. So I'll just finish by saying that uh, the Keck telescope has revealed rocky, the rocky nature of Earth-sized planets. They are clearly common in the galaxy, certainly in the universe as well. If you wanted to extrapolate to the molecular biologists, they would say, well, if you have lukewarm planets with liquid water, uh, the amino acids will almost certainly combine eventually into proteins and replicating molecules. So it is likely that at least simple single-celled life is common in the universe. And then I think a great future is for the Keck Observatory to continue this work and search the nearest stars for Earth-like planets. So I'll stop there. <laughs>